Hello and welcome to what amounts to the final module of the History of the American Musical. I really appreciate you stayed with us throughout this entire time. Also, there will be, uh, in addition to these lectures and the material that's from today's final lecture, uh, you'll also be seeing an announcement attached to this module with some details about the final and the final itself. Um, this, uh, what you're watching right now, theoretically will be broadcast on uh, Friday. You have uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, your choice to uh, take the final and finish the course. And we'll be posting grades based on that final uh, either Monday or Tuesday of next week. So once again, uh, we have today's lecture, we have a final exam, which will be sort of the final module right after this, and I'll be correcting those. So uh, if you have questions, please uh, send me an, uh, an email or something. Today I have uh, two final uh, 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 units to talk to you about. This section will be about the uh, composer Jerry Herman, and the final uh, unit, which will be in a, in a part of today's lecture, will be about the songwriting team of Kander and Ebb. Uh, Jerry Herman uh, grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, he was the son of a summer camp owner. Uh, he originally trained to be an interior designer at the Parsons School of Design uh, before he switched to drama and went to the University of Miami. Uh, he later uh, became, among other things, a professional florist and trained in the art of millinery, which is the, um, the uh, fancy women's hats, basically making hats. Um, he first attracted attention with an off-Broadway review of songs that he had written himself. Um, when you talk about a review, R-E-V-U-E, in the theater, you are talking about a certain kind of show. You're talking about a show that does not have a plot, a show that does not have a set original score, but rather is almost a concert. It is a collection of songs, and those songs are united by either one theme or by the fact that they're written by one composer. Um, it's more like an evening of this person's songs with a loosely connected um, amount of dialogue that sort of just either tells you the story of the song or why it's relevant to the topic. Um, in, uh, in Herman's case, he wrote his own collection of songs and opened them up as a review called Parade in 1960. Um, he had taken a job at that point as a nightclub cabaret pianist, and Parade was the result of the, of the club owner's decision to allow him to showcase some of his original work instead of playing other people's. Um, Jerry Herman, obviously, was he was gay. He had um, a number of relationships that were very difficult for him to publicly uh, declare and wrestled a great deal with, with that aspect of his life. And it would later affect his work. It would later have something to do with a major project of his that he would return to writing after an absence for some time. But um, his first big claim to fame comes to us in 1964. Um, and that would be a show called Hello, Dolly. Um, Hello, Dolly is a musicalization in other words, it's, uh, it's you know, a musical based on a non-musical play. The original play was called The Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder. You might know him as the author of Our Town. We also wrote this play about uh, this very over-the-top character, Dolly Levi, and, and the way that she sort of meddles in the lives of a variety of people in this turn-of-the-century town and changes a lot of people's lives and finds a very eccentric sort of uh, romance of her own. Uh, at the same time, and uh, the piece itself was a, re a real smash in a lot of ways and, and kind of a breakthrough. One of the things about Herman, having talked to you about the way people like Stephen Sondheim and, and others were sort of turning the musical around and, and creating new, new frontiers for it, you know, modern dress without historical or foreign costumes. Um, Sondheim was doing characters who, who swear, who, who have sex, who do adult-themed things, um, and, and a lot of other people were following that, that pattern. However, Herman almost stood up as a reactionary to that, um, as almost a throwback, and, and, and cleaved even more, more strongly to the idea that one should do an old-fashioned piece that was set in an old-fashioned time and place. Most of Herman's plays, when you see them, could easily have been written decades before. They look like older shows than they are. And Hello, Dolly is probably a pretty good example of that. Um, there are a couple of other things about Dolly that I have to tell you, um, one of which is very important. Dolly was actually the subject of 
uh, a very complicated lawsuit. Um, it was to have been the product of a different composer, a man named Bob Merrill. But when the director, um, Gower Champion, was unhappy with the material, a lot of other people were brought in to contribute, mainly Ehrman. And he eventually contributed enough that he was called the composer of the show. Uh, still, in uh, another wrinkle on this, um, in 1967, another songwriter, a man named Mac David, uh, sued Jerry Herman, claiming that some of the songs in Dolly were his own, and also claiming that some of them were, were rewrites of material that David had, had created and offered that was rejected. He had offered a song called Sunflower. Um, the champion and the others said that they didn't want that song in the show, and then a song came in the show by Herman that, that they felt sounded an awful lot like it. And Herman wound up paying a six-figure settlement to Hal, to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. David, Mac David, and you know, officially the outcome of that settlement was that on one hand, Herman would pay a large sum of money to this person, and on the other hand, it would be agreed that Herman would continue to be credited as the sole composer on the piece, and that there would be no further attribution to anyone else. So officially, on paper. Hello, Dolly was entirely written by Jerry Herman. Perhaps, depending on how you look at it, maybe that's not the case. Uh, nonetheless, um, Dolly remains one of the real classics of Broadway, and it actually has another strange distinction. I'm going to talk to you about the Beatles for a second, believe it or not. You know, in 1964, I'm sure you know, the Beatles sort of took over the American charts. What people don't seem to realize about that is the way that they did that was partly through very savvy marketing. Long before the Beatles invasion in 1964, uh, billboards, advertisements, the Beatles are coming, and no one knew what they were. A very large advance was put out to make sure that people knew that this, this group was coming uh, from their record label, Capitol Records. Um, later, uh, they would, uh, at one point, occupy, which is fascinating, all 10 slots on the billboard top 10 of the top 100 simultaneously. Some of that happened because a lot of Beatle records were, you know, there were albums, but a lot of singles were released simultaneously, which was a marketing ploy that no one had tried before. In other words, instead of just saying, this is the main song from the album, we're going to push this, there were a bunch of songs that came out roughly the same time. So the Beatles also held on to a stranglehold on the number one spot in the Billboard Hot 100 for much of 1964, and they would just take over one song after another. Now, if I were to tell you who could break a months-long stranglehold that one performing act had on the Billboard Hot 100's number one slot after, you know, maybe nine to ten consecutive weeks, uh, I don't think you would pick um, a semi-retired uh, trumpeter from New Orleans in his 60s performing a cover of a Jerry Herman song, but that is what happened. Uh, Hello Dolly, the single, as recorded by Louis Armstrong, is one of the few uh, independent singles to overtake the Beatles during the year of 1964 and take the number one spot away from them. A very odd uh, statistical occurrence. Um, Hello Dolly also featured Barbara Streisand in the, the film version of, 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 the, uh, of the musical. Um, Streisand won Best Actress for her role in Hello Dolly, the, the Oscar for Best Actress, and the only tie in the Academy of Motion Picture History. Um, she tied with Audrey Hepburn, appearing in another film at the same time. Now, because Barbara Streisand had done several films at the time, she was also a voting member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And I have to think that if she were nominated for Best Actress, perhaps she would vote for herself, which would probably have created a tie. Otherwise, Cedric Hepburn would have won by one vote be the judge of that one. Um, finally, Hello Dolly was also a vehicle for Carol Channing. And I was just speaking with uh, someone just a few moments ago who said, you know, you really should talk about Carol Channing for a few minutes. She is truly another wonderful icon of the American theater. It happens that uh, Channing, who played Dolly on stage, is also someone that through incredible fate I have personally run into in repeated occasions in my life. And um, I was in a Bickford's in Carol with Carol Channing after a production that she had done with Cheetah Rivera. A friend of mine was playing the, uh, the piano for that production and said, some of us are going out after the show. Do you want to go out to get pancakes? And I never in my dreams imagined that 
two of Broadway's biggest legends were part of the group of people who were going to the Bickfords in Alston. Um, interestingly, Carol brought her own pork chop that she had sealed in a baggie from a previous meal in another city and asked them to heat that in the kitchen. I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time. Uh, one interesting story about Carol Channing that, that I think you might find is a little less personal than you might find interesting, though, is that uh, Channing, who is very much alive now, had written um, an autobiography. And in her autobiography, she referred to a boy that she thought was cute, that she had a, a crush on in elementary school, that she had lost track of him because he was like in fifth grade with her. And she wondered whatever happened to him because she always thought that they had a special bond. Well, that man read her autobiography, um, and in his 80s, contacted the publisher and said, I'm that guy that's in that chapter, and caught up with Carol Channing. And in her 80s, she, she married him. So there's a, there's a cute story for you. Um, Herman, his next hit after Hello, Dolly, was decidedly all his. After a less than successful production about Ben Franklin, came a production in 1966 called Mame, which is an adaptation of a semi-autobiographical novel by Patrick Dennis about his eccentric aunt. Um, we follow Mame through all kinds of ups and downs in the play. She throws wild parties. She... Uh, inherits a large farm, she becomes a big New York socialite, she has an act um, on the stage. Um, through all of it, it's sort of seen through the eyes of her nephew, who, who sort of has this, I grew up because my this character's parents pass away, and he winds up with his only living relative, who's this very eccentric socialite. And it, it proved to be a very successful vehicle for a number of important actresses as well, including Angela Lansbury, uh, playing Auntie Mame, uh, and uh, Bay Arthur as her friend Vera Charles. Um, this one, um, Herman made it a point to have people around all the time because he wanted it to be indisputably his own. And as a result, there's no question, as there might be with Dolly, as to whether he, all the songs were written by the same person. Dolly and Maine come out of a period in the 1960s where, and we've talked about this with a couple of other shows and some of my more recent lectures, there really seems to be a period here of what we call a star vehicle. The idea that a lot of shows in the 60s count heavily on one very, very famous person playing one very big, larger-than-life eccentric character, and that that person really anchors the show. This happens in shows ranging from Fiddler on the Roof to Man of La Mancha to Hello, Dolly to Mame. A lot of the shows in the 1960s, for whatever reason, seem to say economically, if we promise people the chance to see this one star, and hopefully their understudy doesn't go on too often, this, this is enough to boost sales, and we can do this with this rather limited investment of just making sure we've built a vehicle for this one particular character. Um, as a result, we get a lot of great characters in the theater, in, in leading roles, ranging from Mama Rose to Dolly to Cherry Hope Valentine and Sweet Cherry. We get a lot of these characters that are sort of like, we're just going to make a whole show about the adventures of one person. And it works pretty well. Um, Herman then kind of went through a down period. Um, he had a string of unsuccessful shows. But the most perhaps other, the most significant other thing that should be said uh, happens much later. You go fast forward from 1966 all the way to 1983. Now, I mentioned that Herman was gay and that he was very much closeted. He would go to parties with a female companion, he would appear at uh, public events, and he just did not, he was intensely private about his relationships. And at one point he was approached by another famous performer and playwright and activist, a man named Harvey Firestein. And Harvey Firestein, you may recognize him, he was an actor, he is an actor, in a, in a wide variety, he has this very deep gravelly voice, you know, and he, he had a, a role in the film Independence Day, he's been in a bunch of He's done cartoon voices. He's been in a bunch of other things. He also appeared recently on Broadway himself as, as Tevye in, in a remake of Fiddler on the Roof and some other shows. And he also was in um, uh, Hairspray for some time. Uh, Firestein said to Jerry Herman, it's an honor to meet you, and I'm kind of disappointed in you because we both know that you're gay and you've never really taken a stand on this. And a lot of people could benefit if you were to really look inside of yourself and, and, and to, to help me perhaps write a play about you know, about how difficult these things can be. And Herman thought it over and he returned, he returned to him later and said, you know what, you're right, I've really done a disservice to, to a lot of people, I, what can I do? How can I help you? Firestein was working on a play called La Cage au Faux, and uh, 
case the spelling is a little odd for you. It is a French phrase, la cage, A-U-X-F-O-L-L-E-S, um, from 1983. La cage fall is based upon a French film. It is also, this phrase, an idiom. It's kind of one of those things that doesn't just mean what it literally means if you translate it from French to English, but also has sort of a collected meaning. Um, F-O-L-L-E -L -L -E is often a word uh, used to refer to a mad woman or an eccentric woman or a very, very over-the-top type of woman. Um, a cage full of these people, full of beautiful, mad, crazy women. It is also a quick phrase to use sometimes to refer to a birdcage. And La Cage of Faux was later, was first made into a musical in 1983. And if any of you have seen the motion picture The Birdcage with... Uh, Robin Williams and Gene Hackman that came out later in the 1990s, that is a remake of this, minus the score and minus the music. It's the tale of a gay couple who have been raising a son together, and the son is straight. He is very much in love with a young lady named Anne, and much like in almost any other story like this, he's nervous to bring her home to his family and to bring her parents into the world of his parents, and he is he asks for a while uh, these folks to sort of try to masquerade as something other than what they are. Um, a lot of hijinks, both comic and not so comic, happen as a result of it, including a traumatic moment where uh, Albat uh, kind of unmasks himself and declares in a very anthemic song, uh, I am what I am. I am what I am became kind of a, a, a rally and kind of an anthem uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of gay communities, um, it's uh, it's a song that all attaches a module, so you'll hear it yourself. And Mr. George Hearn received a Tony Award for playing the role, and uh, and sang the song very well. Um, the show is filled with very very familiar uh, melodies. Another song is a song called "The Best of Times Is Now." Interesting story about that. In 1992, uh, George H. W. Bush, the first President Bush. Uh, was running for re-election against Bill Clinton and needed um, a, a song and wanted a theme song for his campaign. And at the Republican National Convention, hours before a lot of balloons were released, he had thought that the best of times is now was a song that said, hey, things are going great. We should stay with who we have in, in, the, in the Oval Office. And um, someone pointed out at the, almost the last minute, you know, Mr. Bush, this is a song that is sung by uh, a collection of transvestites in a bar, and I don't know if it's what you really want, and they hastily removed it. I kind of, to this day, think it would have been very amusing if it was the official uh, Bush campaign song. Um, there's kind of a tragic story here at the end of this. Um, in 1992, uh, Herman was diagnosed with HIV and um, went into complete retirement. Um, then his longtime partner, who had been secretly his partner for over 30 years, uh, also passed away uh, from complications due to AIDS, and it left Herman very much a recluse. Um, he decided, obviously, to focus on his health. Now I'm at least happy to report, in today's day and age, with you know protease inhibitors and all that sort of thing, that he is actually still very much alive. Um, Angela Lansbury caught up with him and convinced him to come out of retirement to write a few songs for a Christmas special called Mrs. Santa Claus in 1994. Um, it would be the first Herman Christmas hit. In fact, the song We Need a Little Christmas is from the musical Mame. It is a point where Auntie Mame is trying to cheer people up, and even though it's not December, she is pulling out Christmas ornaments in some eccentric way to say, you know, we could use Christmas to cheer us all up. Let's just have Christmas now. And it's become kind of a popular song at Christmas parades and stuff. Uh, Herman's written a number of Christmas hits, actually. And um, so it was no stretch for him to write music for Lansbury for this special. He also wrote an autobiography in 1999, which is where we get most of the material I've been talking to you about today. And he's still very much alive and uh, retired in Florida, where he answers a great deal of his mail and is at least has at least sort of rejoined the community uh, at large, the, the society, and has stopped from hiding from the world and, and feels that he's you know, taking life one day at a time, I guess. Um, but anyhow, uh, Herman is very much an old-fashioned composer. His material sounds like stuff you can take your grandma to without offending her or shocking her very much. 
Um, he's never going to, except for perhaps Lacage, he never really writes anything that's particularly jarring or political. Lacage is like a fascinating ex exception to this rule. Here's the man who wrote Maine, who wrote Dolly, who wrote some of the music for A Day in Hollywood, A Night in Ukraine, and some other pieces, and yet wrote this incredibly subversive musical that that really brought attention to a lot of issues in the 1980s. So, so it's kind of a, a two-sided point. But Herman is certainly one of those composers that people look to for a real good old-fashioned music. It's funny that much of his music is extremely conservative in the sense that it, is, it harkens back to an earlier era. And a lot of folks who like old-fashioned tunes tend to like things written by Herman. Well, that's, that's the Jerry Herman thing and the tale on him. Um, I have one more tale to tell you at our next about Candor and Ebb when we return, and thanks for listening.